Hey, what's up? It's Chanel. Welcome to a new episode of Vital Vinyl Vlog. Today we're gonna kind of metaphysically time travel to, let's start around 2002, and we're going to go to about 2007, 2008 here, okay? And the reason I'm doing this First off, we're going to be blasting some Time Ghoul in the background, which might confuse some of you based on the title of this video, but trust me, I'm going to get to that. Now, in the 90s, when it came to technical death metal, most people were looking at atheist death, the gore guts. Since we're going to be speaking about Canada, gore guts are just a massive, massive, important band when it comes to everything. And the more you go down the 90s, you know, this bad boy came out. But even if you go back and check out Cryptopsy's demo, it's just top fucking shelf death metal. And when it comes to Time Ghoul, it just shows a more spacey Midwest death metal, and it's fucking great. Like, when it comes to technicality, songwriting, etc., the fact that these two demos from 1992 and 1994, when mixed with Demilich, create its own subgenre called Demigool, that's pretty fucking cool. But... Here's the weird part. First, we have to turn off the mighty time goal. I can't wait for the cassette reissues. Although, I really do wish Caustic Cassettes would have been able to do them, as I've mentioned quite a few times this week. It's all good. Like, it's in good hands with this and the tapes. But, uh, it's just one of those things where, to me, it just would make more sense for a label out of the Midwest to reissue this. But it is what it is, you know. The fact that these are getting released on cassette again is just fucking rad. And the only thing, like, this was officially... You know, mastered for vinyl by Dan Lowndes at Renaissance Sound. And Mike remixed uh, Tumultuous Travelings. Uh, if you go to their band camp, there's a link. It says, I'll buy that for a dollar. And it's like an alternative mix of the demo. So I don't know which version is going to be on there. They both are very similar. I mean, I'm not a sound engineer, so I couldn't really tell the difference. Excuse me. But, there was a weird, weird little window where technical death metal really, 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 like, took off. And what I mean by took off is, like, if I wanted to go see, like, Immolation, there would legitimately be, like, 40 people at the show. Like, I swear. Like, there were plenty of times, like, my ex-girlfriend would down the street in one of the main venues in Philly that used to hold death metal shows. All age death metal shows. I wasn't 21 yet. So, uh, that actually is a problem sometimes and it's kind of pointless like I mean like I, I get it you know but like all age shows the older I get the more annoyed I get how's it going but that's just I mean the nature of getting older like because you know at one point in time I was that you know savage that would get in the pit grab some kid as a battering ram 
and run fucking directly across the pit into the other group of people, make everybody back up and then do the same thing again. I, I was a savage when it came to that stuff. Like, I moshed hard as loud as, I mean, as lame as that sounds. Like, dude, I, I did not play. And I, I, was, I was pretty big, too. Like, I, I was in, in shape back then. Like, the best shape in, in my life. But today, I want to talk about a band that I really, I was so surprised when this randomly popped up on Facebook. A buddy of mine, he runs this distribution called Scumlord. And he put out a tape that I was just like, whoa, 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 what? Like, holy shit. And it just blew me away. And that's Beneath the Massacre with their debut full length, Mechanics of Dysfunction. Now, it would have been amazing if he was the awesome issue, the EP that introduced the world to Beneath the Massacre. And if you don't know who Beneath the Massacre are, stop right now, and if you call them Death Core, just, I, I get it, you know, short-haired death metal was the thing back then. Kind of looking professional when you played was, like, kind of important. And it all came on the backs of this one record, which is actually a sophomore record, which came out in 2004. And that record is in my hands. This launched the release of the 80s records and started an entire tour series called Summer Slaughter. That's Necrophagist with Epitaph. On a label that was once very mighty during this time period also, because we can go back to the Dillinger Escape Plan and start there if we really wanted to, when it comes to just, you know, way more outside of the box thinking, you know, being a little bit more mainstream and whatnot. But, um, like, you would legit go to, you know, like, Deicide, and one time I saw Cryptopsy at the First Unitarian Church in Philly. They were supposed to originally, like, listen to this lineup. I have the poster. Ah, the lineup was Misery Index, Neraxis, Cryptopsy, and Necrophagist. Because I remember Necrophagist was like the, you know, like Necrophagist was the headliner. Like they were playing over Cryptopsy with Lord Worm. And Cryptopsy had just put out that Once Was Not record. The last record with Lord Worm on it. After the DeSalvo years. And then there's the None So Live album that has a different vocalist on it. And the only reason they got Lord Worm back was because they couldn't teach this guy English. Because he's French-Canadian, so he speaks French. So... Cryptopsy, pretty much, in my opinion, alongside War Guts, obviously. And there's plenty of others, but War Guts are, like, the number one, I feel, influence when it comes to technical Canadian death metal. And then Cryptopsy. But there was just this time period where the tighter you played was, like, just more important than anything else. Like, it was, you know, more just about, like, guitar solos, short, nice hair. Like, sometimes, you know, you'd have some, like, random hesh dudes in the band, but sometimes 
most of the time you have some short-haired ex-hardcore kid that is finally getting a paycheck and whatnot for, you know, playing live tunes, and good for them. But after a while, some of this technical death metal started getting kind of stale, and at the same time, for the movement, where, like I said, a lot of ex-hardcore kids, and I'm not, hardcore has never died, but hardcore, just like metal, goes in these cycles. Like right now with death metal, we're, I would say, on cycle number 30. Like in my lifetime, this is cycle 30 for me. Because everything goes around. Like there's going to be a time period in like probably a year. I, I'd give it maybe two more years where like you're going to be, and like, I mean, no, I'm just using Church of Disgust as an example because I'm looking at their poster. Where you're going to be after, like, Acid Witch material more than, like, Veneration of the Church of Disgust. Just because the way shit works. It's just the way it is. Stuff, like I said, it goes in a circle and... You know, right now, we're at... Because... When did... And, like, when did Maggot Stomp start? Like, 2018? 27? New stuff come, like, 20, 2018, 2017? I have the first... Because, to me, that was, like, the... The second revival of American death metal for younger kids. I felt like it was a great stepping stone, but also, you know, there's certain bands that they helped get out there that I feel, you know, really stand out. Like Mortal Wound and Gutless. Like they even did an awesome split together. But just really, you know, awesome stuff. I have the Gutless LP, but it's out of order, of course. But, um, Super, oh, here it is. My bad. But, like, super, super sick shit. And it really, you know, helped launch a bunch of smaller labels that have been killing it lately by putting it out. Not only badass demos, but a label like Goat Throne Records. You know, going, releasing shit like this, it's important to metal in general and just to people like me. I'm just like, oh my god, hell yeah. And, you know, I bring it up all the time. I call it cassettes. Like, it's amazing. But... Back to what I'm trying to talk about. There was a time period where, like, this short-haired death metal trend, like, really wasn't a trend anymore. It was pretty much what death metal was, unless, like I said, and I've said it multiple times, I can't believe you listened to Incantation still. That shit is so boring, dude. I, I played a show with The Faceless back in 2006. Napalm Death, The Faceless, Animosity. Like, that's the thing. Like, dude, like, these tours were just like little festivals. It was fuck. It was so. It was just such a weird time for metal, but. This is what was so surprising to me, because Beneath the Massacre, they put this EP out before this. And the EP was pretty much necrophagous with breakdowns. Like, that was what it was. And it just set my space on fire. Like, seriously. If Beneath the Massacre was not in your top eight 
I'm not even joking. There was a chance you probably were not going to get booked to play a show. Like, it was so ridiculous for a little time, like, when it came to just how popular this band was just by pretty much playing airtight metal, but adding breakdowns to it. And I still will stand by. MySpace had the best music player in the game. Like, I... This was, and this is before the whole Joe Rogan nonsense. I have been anti-Spotify for a very long time. Music was on there. I kind of... Yeah, I, I wasn't mad, but, like, I kind of told... I was like, yeah, like, you got it. Like, please don't... Like, I kind of told... I was like, yeah, like, you got it. Like, please don't renew. Like, like we got to... We got to take that. I'm, I'm, I don't know if it's... I hope it's not... I hope it's not renewed and our music is no longer up there because you're not helping anyone out but Spotify. Like, you might randomly pop up on somebody's, you know, randomly pop up on somebody's, you know, like, uh, shuffle playlist. But for the most part, it's pretty pointless. You're getting, like, no, it's just not at all what you think. Because I know people that are like, well, your band's on Spotify. you got to be getting paid. It's like, who are the, like, who have you been talking to? Like, it's not how it works. And, like, on Bandcamp Fridays, if you folks knew how that actually worked, you would be like, like, that's not cool. You made negative 76 cents. Like, yeah, it's kind of a bummer sometimes when you find how real shit works. Like, you want to play Ozfest during this time period also? You better have $40,000 ready or you're going to borrow it from your record label because who's going to turn down that type of opportunity? Even if you end up playing at 9 a.m. every day of the tour, I mean, still you get to see Black Sabbath every night. So that's a plus. But when I first found out, like, how much going on Ozfest costs, I was just like, wait, so you're, no matter what, going to lose money. You're not going to gain money. Like, if your band, I'm not going to name the band, but I'll put it this way. They were a death metal band that's pretty popular. But, like, I'll put it this way, and I mean no offense by this, like, there's a glass ceiling on death metal. And there's the thing about this time period also, it kind of broke this glass ceiling. But there's only a handful of bands that legitimately have broken through the death metal glass ceiling. Normally, they just get stuck, and they're content with where they are, and that's fine. Sometimes it's fine. Other times, it's like, damn, you've got the same album seven times. Like, you're, like, come on. How many records can you write, you know? Like, I remember when I started making albums, like, again, on a regular basis, I was just like, like, the one song title was just, like, Ned Egg God. It was like, dude, are you even trying? Like, come on. Like, I know if you could probably come up with a better song title than that. But when it came to the new wave of Canadian technical death metal, it really came on the toes, I feel, of the popularity that Necrophagus and this sounds very dated, but Eckerday just brought this weird, like, I don't want to say scene, but just for some reason, it, like, caused this resurgence of bands just, like, wanting to add sweet picking 
and like all sorts of like extra guitar solos, very polished production. Like if you go and listen to almost any death metal release, for example, listen to Cannibal Corpse Kill. That came out during this time period. And just listen to the production. The production is like perfect. It's seriously, it's like dialed. And it's in a way, like that's probably legitimately my favorite Corpse Grinder era Cannibal Corpse record. Besides Vile. Like, legit. Like, I really like that, that, that record. But the production is. You know, it's a Mana Studios recording, but it was during a time period where that crispy production was what everyone wanted. Like, if Fetid was to have came out during 2005, yeah, that you, it would have had a small following, and that would have been it. Like, for real. Like, it would have stayed underground. Certain death metal has always just been underground until semi-recently and in, like, 1993. Like I said, things go in circles. And really quickly, I'm going to play you a track from the debut. Yeah, like, when Onset of Putrefaction came out, I could have sworn... And I could be wrong here, but I swear I had an original version that had drum machine. Like, it had a drum machine, and it was just Muhammad on everything. And then I swear Relapse recorded it the full, like with the Epitaph lineup. I don't know if I... I for some reason, that might have either been something that was in the works and never happened, or I'm just mixing some shit up because my brain sucks. But anybody right now, if you can open like a side window, see if there's two different versions of Necrophagus on Step to Putrefaction. But the Beneath the Massacre EP legitimately, like, blew down all these boundaries that had kind of been set up, like, you know, when it came to just death metal in general. But then you had bands like Despised Icon, where you had two vocalists, which at first it was male and female, and then... Alex, who I think used to do, used to drum in Naraxis, took over for vocals, and they were kind of leading, at the time, the Quebec movement, as it was just straight up, like, hardcore mixed with brutal death metal, and I guess that's what you kids call deathcore, but we always just looked at it as... It's, you know, it's it's brutal death metal. But it's just, you know... Like, when Job for a Cowboy came out, we didn't know the term deathcore. We just thought it was fucking garbage. So, but is that reissue a different lineup? Like, was it just reissued with the original... I remember that, but I'm just wondering about the, the lineup. Is it just Muhammad, or is it a full band that played on it? I just forget, but... Despised Icon started making waves, doing tours with, like, the Black Dahlia murder. So, you had, you know, these Stepping Stone bands. And one happened to be from Quebec. And at the time, Cryptopsy... You know, they didn't have a front man, like, because they were building up to the return of Lord Worm and whatnot. But during this time frame where all these bands from Canada started coming down, like Neraxis, Ion Dissonance, and really 
Beneath the Massacre, in my opinion, was the band that really, like, kind of changed the game, like I said, because they had, you know, the heaviness and whatnot of, like, despised icon, but it was definitely rooted more in brutes. Yo, check it out. Birds can only work or win. Sometimes you see the... Forgot to rewind. Sometimes you just need to hear the real thing. But... I remember this album, though. Really, like, just blowing everyone away. Like... I wish the thank you list was a little bit easier to read, but like, I can name some of the bands right here, like, yeah, Lang Chi was huge, Despised Icon, Naraxis, The Red Chord, So Fall Carnage, Misery Index, Did the Fall, like, there were all these bands that, like, I mean, even exhumed and whatnot, like. But then there's some band that just made me laugh, like, from a second story window. And it's like, ew. Ew. Like, there's some garbage in here. Like, seriously, that's the thing. Like, I remember I saw a perfect murder with Soylent Green. Uh. Fuck, fuck. Was it Crowbar? It might, oh no, I saw Crowbar with Entombed. Like, that was pretty fucking cool. And here's, a, like, here's another thing. Crowbar with Entombed in 2004 at the Trocadero Balcony. This is a venue that legitimately held 40 people tops. And like, it didn't sell out. You just walked up. It was no big deal. Like, a Cannibal Corpse is playing with Macabre, Napalm Death, and Jungle Rock. Nowadays, forget about it. That's sold out. You know, like, back then, you could show up during the third band and no big deal. Like, you know, they would probably let you in for free, honestly. Like, my ex-girlfriend would purposely wait until, like... The head, like, close to when the headlining band would play. And then she would just, like, wait outside and, like, one of the bouncers would be like, Hey, like, what are you doing? And she'd just say, I'm waiting for my boyfriend. And he'd be like, oh, you can go in. It was no big deal. But then you would go to, like, let's just say... Like, my ex at the time, like, she wanted to go, and we went to a High on Fire show when they first put out Blessed Black Wings and started finally getting popular. And the last time I had saw High on Fire, I'm not even joking, there were 40 people there. And... I was like, oh, you know, it'll, it'll be fine. And we get to the, like, the first Unitarian, and it's ass to elbows packed. And I was like, whoa. And then I found out, I, I didn't know at the time, the band that was opening for them, the Bronx. I think it was, they were called the Bronx. They were very popular. That was who everybody was there to see. I'm like, you know, I'm like, oh, yeah, it's like, but then, once people caught the second tour for Black Wings was a lot different. And it was the same with, like, Mastodon. Like, Mastodon would play this dive bar with, like, in front of, like, 15 people. So the way shit was. But these bands, and just death metal in general, of the younger variety, was on fire. Like, you have no idea, like, legitimately how much crap I used to get for liking certain bands. Like, 
Morbid Angel, you kind of always got to pass. Same with, like, Suffocation and Obituary. But, God forbid, like, I'd wear my Mortician shirt. Oh, dude. Like, I still don't believe you like that shit, man. Like, it's so boring. It's like, that's what I like. Like, sorry. And Coffins was a big one. Especially this record right here, Mortuary Darkness. My friends hated this. For real, like, they just did not understand how I liked it. Because stuff like this was completely running the scene at the time. And here's what was so cool about it, too. Because you had a mix of necrophagists and shit, and other bands knew a little bit about Texas death metal. So, you started having bands that had insane technicality with over-the-top brutal death metal vocals. That's where a band like Canada's Despised Icon really came in. You know, they would open up for, like, similar bands, but just kind of steal the show because they were so fucking heavy. Unless they were opening for Suffocation, which I've seen happen, like, twice. And there's a big Suffocation connection, also. But here, like, just listen to how insane this is. Sorry for the close-up of my beard, but, alright, so, here's the thing. Now, do you hear how, like, trippy and perfect that sounds? Like, the drums are triggered to hell, the vocals are, like, perfectly crisp, guitar work is, like, immaculate. you heard, that was like, absolutely, see, I'm, I was going to get to the birth in a minute, but I was just blown away that someone even cared enough about Beneath the Master to reissue this on cassette, because 
to me, this is a, like I said, a very, like, standout record during that time period of the mid-2000s when stuff was just very weird with death metal in general. Like, for example, now, let's compare that with the new body asphyxiation science, which is what is now popular technical death metal. Or we can go the artificial brain route. What do you think a better example would be? I'll take your folks' advice real quick. Artificial brain or body asphyxiation science when it comes to technical death, modern tech death. Just, I'll play it. That's all I'm asking. Otherwise, I'm going to pick something myself. Alright, I'm picking something myself then. So, we're going to put blood incantation on. And, well, we all know blood incantation. So, you know what? We're going to put artificial brain on. I don't have any Naraxis, sadly, anymore. I used to, but we're going to put on Labyrinth Constellation. But just to show how, like, just weird that, you know, this whole entire cycle of death metal is. Because before you knew it, it was gone. Like, the technical death metal revival, physically, was, like, gone. And Beck was absolutely, you know, crushing, gross, awesome death metal. And it kind of didn't come overnight. Around 2011, it started rumbling. But I really feel, and again, this is just my personal opinion, when Fetid changed their, I meant when Of Corpse changed their name to Fetid and put the demo tape out, this was a game changer. Suddenly, all these filthy sounding bands started coming out of the Pacific Northwest and the depths of, like, Oakland, California. And they started reclaiming the death metal scene. And I don't want to... They, they started... Again, like I said, everything works in a circle. They began bringing things kind of back to where when I joined Skeleton Proof Tanks in 2004, like I said, it was a very weird time for death metal. Like, Wendigang is a great example also. But right now, just for the technicality's sake, we're going to put on artificial brain. I reviewed the new Mortiferum, so check out the review, because I really don't want to get off topic, just because my brain. So, I wish I could get an artificial brain, but... So, anyways, I was saying, there came a time where, you know, good bands like Necrot, you had Spectral Voice, Blood Incantation, Fetid, Wundagang, then like Cerebral Rock came out with Station of Life, followed by Mortiferum, well I forget which came first, Altar of Decay or Station of Life. And then there was the whole town movement and whatnot, like Frontal insane. Again, everything's full circle. So right now, we're back to kind of where there's some really gnarly technical death metal bands that 
you know, don't get finger pointed at them because, you know, they have actual metalheads playing music and whatnot. And I think it's kind of weird because if our brain was to have, you know, their date, like if this was to have came out in 2006, it probably would have been one of the biggest bands in America. And I'm being dead serious. Like when it comes to death metal, absolutely. And you'll hear why. Because to me, this was things kind of working their way full circle. Except for this was a lot better for me. It was more of what I wanted during that time period. Like, as you can hear, like, from the jump, the production is obviously a little muddy. It's not perfectly crisp. It's the way I always like my death metal to sound. And although during a time period, like I said, when, you know, I was really a fan of Beneath the Massacre. I was really a fan of it. I wish I still had some of my Naraxis t-shirts. Like Ion Dissonance. I was a fan of that stuff. But at the same time, I was more a fan of the old shit. And again, like, if I was wearing this in 2005, you... <laughs> Look at this, like, this, this guy still likes immolation. Little did they know, hey, guess who's still standing tall? Immolation. Guess who has a new record coming out? Immolation. Hey, what's Jeff for a cowboy up to, brah? How's that two-inch zipper, you know, treating you in your 40s? Trends come and go, people. Like, I'm sorry if you went out and bought some $80 pit pipers and you don't like snowboard or anything like that. I get it. Like, I really do. I get it. It's cool. It's popular. I know some of you, like, you know, you might be looking for a relationship. And, hey... That profile photo, you know, that, that, that's got to that's gotta pop. It's got to have that, you know, you got to look like, it would be like, you know, uh, pull like Fonzie. One of my favorite record labels, James, is one of the first people that ever supported this channel. Legitimately, he was one of the first labels that sent shit over to get reviewed. I love James. I think he has one of the best pieces of music when it comes to the underground. And same with like, Mr. Brown at uh, Caligari Records. Like, for example, dude, is it like heavy, bro? But like, Artificial Brain is heavy and I'm interested to hear that without Will on vocals, but I heard 30 minutes of the new record. Holy shit. It is awesome. But Will is going to be focusing full time with 
uh, Afterlife. I mean, Afterbirth. So, good for Afterbirth, but I forget who our official brand have uh, filling in for Will, but pretty much, if this was to have came out in the mid 2000s, this probably would be considered a game changing metal record. Because nobody at the time was really taking from the pages of Demi Lich, Time Ghoul, and all that stuff until, you know, like, I would say, sorry, probably like 2011. And a lot of stuff before that was just kind of, I wouldn't say trying to play catch up. But, like, it was just a very weird time period for everyone. But there were some bands that were lucky enough to keep it real, be able to play badass shows, like, Kansas. But then at the same time, like, my band opened up for Skinless. Like, my band opened up for Vital Remains twice. And we got thanked on the Icons of Evil record. Like, that was, to me, that was so crazy. Like, we were just this, like, brutal man that was, like, trying our best not to fit in with, you know, what bands like Beneath the Massacre were doing. We wanted to sound like a beat up copy of Suffocation's Effigy of the Forgotten. But during that time period, everybody was like, why do you guys, what, you guys want to do a tape? Like, like, what, like, what's wrong with you? And I just never understood, like, you know, like, during that time, too. Like, I remember I wanted to do a seven minute to make the record, like, what kind of, like, scoffed at me. They were like, it's seven, like, what, what, what? Nobody's going to buy it. I was like, dude, yes, yeah. like, trust me, I, I... I was still going to enough hardcore shows that I knew Seven Inches sold pretty good. And whenever I'd work the Relapse merch table at shows, we would always sell tons of Seven Inches. And so I just was, I thought it was kind of a no-brainer, but we just ended up doing a DIY fucking three-inch CD instead. And, you know, it's the one release from my old band, like, I don't have. But I wish I actually had a copy of Soundproof Tanks, just so I could let you hear how the sound of the time, it had to be there a little bit. Otherwise, you were left on, you were going to be still, you know, we got to open up for, like, Mortal Decay. And empty. Nobody, like, seriously, nobody cared. Like, we played a shit fuck the best. Dead bird. The dream is dead. And one other, like, grime band. I just can't remember their name. And legitimately, based, it was just where the venue was in this really bad neighborhood. It's called the Boiler Room. I used to love, we used to play there a lot, like, we played there with Dark Faith, but, like, we got booked a couple times playing, like, cross-punk house shows, like, basement shows, and we had no business playing that shit, you know, like, we had straight up, like, suffocation breakdowns and shit, and it was just like, oh, like, you know, I didn't like playing those shows, because I don't like people jumping top of me with 40 bottles like like one time I had a, a giant crowd pile up on top of me what's going on just everybody had like legit like I got attacked with by like a bunch of punks with 40 bottles just like having fun though like it wasn't like, malicious or anything like they were just having a good time but back to mid 2000s death metal because pretty much every band had 
this type of production. And I'll play some more of it so you can hear what I'm talking about. Legit, you know, all the props in the world, just because I don't know how the hell I put that was a band that played that uh Soylent Green show I was talking about into the moot. Oh, dude, that whole sick of it all video where they like show all the mosh moves. I used to like picking up change, and I, I'd pick up change or pick up onions, but. I can't really do it with my neck, but I'd pick up and then swing back as hard as I fucking could, and then swing this arm back, and then donkey kick as hard as I could back. I was an asshole. Like, if I was moshing, I was an asshole. I'll admit it. And I'm sorry. If I ever accidentally hit you, I was a dick. Because I was one of those guys where if you were standing behind the uh <laughs> like if like let's say this is you know where people are standing this is the pit this is where people are standing on the outside and this is just a bunch of people i was that dickhead that would run jump over everybody else and land over here like all the people that weren't moshing and we're just trying to enjoy the show because back then, you could kind of do whatever you want. I mean, FSU would check you every now and again, but I was lucky enough to be friends with some of those guys and luckily never had a problem. But there were certain times I was definitely an asshole when it came to moshing, stage diving. But my stage dive move was always a front flip. I would always front flip. Just because it felt, it always just felt safe. I hated when people would jump like fucking, you know, feet first. It's like, dude, like, ah, like, you know. And nowadays, you know, I can't even be close to that shit with my injury. Yeah, dude, that's what I, that's what I did too, but I, I was done moshing unless a band really you know, I don't know what you want me to say about the Crypt of Earth. Their first record was awesome, but then that pedophilia thing happened, and then they, like, stopped even doing anything with the first record, turned into a death tribute band almost with their second full length, because I remember I hated the second album. I was like, what happened to the suffocation worship? Like... What is this? It sounds like death symbolic. And at the time, it was like, I'd rather just listen to death symbolic. Because I was that type of person. And I always have been. And beneath the massacre, and one of the reasons why I made this video is because there was a time period where this was like the most popular new band the scene 
And I mean, you know, if, if you actually like look past the production and stuff, it's all there. I mean, I know some of you kids right now are like, listen to that breakdown. transition that was fucking sick but like that style of production I just remember trying so hard to avoid it but people they weren't into muddy like I'm telling you it's a weird weird time for extreme metal like I found myself listening to like more power violence crust sludge, but mostly neurosis. I kind of legitimately, I don't know if it was just due to how unpersonal, I guess, the music was. Because, you know, I don't know anything about music theory and shit like that, but like, you know, I know what's good and what's not. But, uh, when it comes to Beneath the Massacre, I always just, you know, thought they were extremely, um, you know, very well put together band. They definitely, at first, I felt like, you know, the EP and this, the mechanics of this were just very, very important when it came to just that time period and stuff. Animosity, I played a show with them also, and, like, it was a good time, you know? Like, stuff like that, it was just very weird. Like, Arsis, for example. Arsis would always get lumped into these shows. And it was just strange, because Arsis pretty much... Before they made that glam record and stuff, they really had... Because Carcass was done, At the Gates was done. Arsis was doing melodic death metal better than anyone else. Like, at the... I mean, Black, the Black Dahlia Murder already had a fan base and whatnot, and already was climbing up the death metal totem pole, which has always... Since I've been around, Cannibal Corpse has pretty much always been sitting pretty. Like, kind of up on top. I mean, Sabbath... I'm pretty sure Cannibal Corpse... Oh no, that was Slayer, my bad. I'm pretty sure... I was gonna say, I'm pretty sure Cannibal Corpse, like, played one of those last Slayer shows. And that just goes to show, like, you know, Cannibal Corpse... No offense here. I'm just going to pick a random one. All right. Who's going to headline? Cannibal Corpse or Deceased? That's an obvious answer. Cannibal Corpse. But it is what it is. Cannibal Corpse has busted their asses for decades to get to where they are. And they deserve to be where they are. But there's, you know, other bands, I feel, that just got left behind. And they didn't really get left behind. It's just, they didn't have the work ethic or the mainstream appeal that a band like Cannibal Corpse had. Because, I mean, when you have, like, Kardashians, like, wearing your clothing... I'm not one of those people. I, I could give a shit. Like, Kim Kardashian, you can rock a Morbid Angel shirt all day. Please check out Blood Incantation and wear their shit on TMZ. But just don't ruin it. Just take it so the boys get some, you know, extra merch money and shit. But, you know, 
congratulations to Blood Incantation also for Time Wave Zero getting very, very good reviews. I know what we're in for, and it's going to be a, just a treat. Cancer, I wouldn't say, is underrated. Cancer is just hard to get shit sometimes. It's expensive. Like, that's my own, like, because otherwise there's, you know, I'm actually a pretty big Cancer fan, and I just don't have any of their records. Like, I'm looking right now, just, I don't even have that many releases from the time period in question, because legitimately, a band like Beneath the Massacre, during that time period, it kind of covered all the bases. But then, Relapse Records, again, this is before they reissued, like, all the death shit. They put out all the old, well, the first three Atheist records at the time. So, Atheist, Peace of Time, Unquestionable Presence, and Elements. Those three death metal records are are the most important progressive technical death metal albums ever to come out of Florida. But for some reason, Relapse got rid of those rights, got the rights to the death catalog, and the rest, you know, has just been slowly doing whatever they possibly can to make money off this. From, because you know for a fact if Chuck was still alive and he saw that they were making Halloween masks out of Repka's album art, pretty sure he would not be happy about it. I'm actually pretty positive he wouldn't be stoked after seeing the Death by Metal documentary. Chuck was a complicated guy. I'll put it that way. If you've never seen the documentary, Chuck seemed pretty hard to work with. From the documentary, it's the way he was kind of... Oh, he would be very... He wouldn't let it happen. I don't even think these reissues would exist if Chuck was still alive. And I hate even bringing that up. Like, the what if Chuck, you know, like that whole butterfly effect thing. Because, I hate to be honest with you, when death was ending, it kind of sadly ended with like a whimper until posthumously, you know, People cared enough that, you know, it is kind of cool that a label that actually has money picked up the catalog, except for Symbolic. Symbolic is still owned by Metal Blade. But, um, you know, because I do really think if Chuck was still alive, and again, I hate saying this, but I think these would be probably bootlegs or just, you know, he would definitely not be cool probably with reissuing that stuff. It's called Death by Metal. It might be on YouTube. I went to the premiere in 2015 and then it didn't actually come out until like 2019, I think. It was kind of crazy like that. Like it, just, it took a very long time to come to fruition after the debut and uh, it was a great premiere too like they had a whole entire death fest afterwards like Dirketa played Topos Nomos played like Disney's played Dying Fetus had to cancel but Misery Index played Clenched Fist played which is a tour cover band it's just fucking cool it was a good time I think hor oh, Horrendous played too. But back to the time period at hand. So when Necro 
they just started touring America after their first Maryland appearance. Whoever started booking them must have had an idea because they were on these like gnarly tours where there was seriously like and it, I feel like every tour it was cattle decapitation misery index either Naraxis, ion dissonance despised icon or it might not have been the time yet but beneath the massacre but they would throw these bands on these tours with necrophagists, which slowly became the Summer Slaughter Tour. And that's how that happened. And where's the Summer Slaughter Tour now? I don't know, and I don't care. Because it's a lying corpse. But, you know what? Remember that, uh... It was like a fake Ozfest underground. Uh, Sounds of the Underground. Remember Sounds of the Underground. Remember Scion when Scion Cars cared about extreme metal. There was some weird kind of like, even, like I'm pretty sure Immolation played that like fest. That fest was ridiculous. Like, that, that Scion car fest. Like, I think it had, like, one of Sleep's, like, first shows back. Uh, it was gnarly. Like, I, I, I forget off the top of my head, but, like, I just remember being like, what the, like, what, what, do, what does Scion cars have to do with McGregor grind? Like, what? It was just very, very weird. But, that lasted like a year and that was it the rug got pulled out that was it Corp played wait sounds of the underground because i know sounds of the underground like the red cord i felt like played it every year that was you know pretty much a bunch of metalcore bands that happened to have death metal parts the death core I don't know. To me, it's just a matter of opinion. That's the word. To me, that's a slam. It's kind of just another way of saying brutal death metal. Like, for example, though, like, putrid womb with slam-induced pariahism. Like, you know, I, I get it. Brutal slam and Texas sickness. But I just like calling it brutal, like just brutal sickness. It doesn't have to be slamming. It's still it's just brutal. But yeah, it's you know crushing. But it's just weird how some of that stuff, like dude, horse the band again, like this weird ass, like. We used to call bands like that white belt grind. And you know what? Fuck daughters. For many reasons. But even back in the day, I hated, 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 hate, 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 hated that band with a passion because I was going through a big, big grind resurgence like in my life I started you know and I have to thank Albert at Pressable Magazine like honestly some of you might be like oh fuck Decibel like, I have friends that work for Decibel it doesn't matter if I thought you know like I'll, I'll be honest with you yes sometimes I read Decibel I'm like what the what, what am I like, what why is this even in here? But then there's other times where it's like, it's rules. Like, hell yeah. Like, print matters. Like, print is all that matters. Especially if you're a fan of fanzines. Print rules. Like, even in the small-ass world that is BMX, 
we have people that go out of their way to make zines. And you know, it just goes and shows the parallels between BMX, skateboarding, and extreme music. The DIY aspect of it, I mean. But uh, it's just very interesting when you take a deep dive into it and whatnot. But it was a certain time period, and a lot of bands sounded extremely similar with that over-triggered drum sound mixed with breakdowns that were just completely over the top with vocals more along the lines of this. And this is where bands like Waking the Daver and Job for a Cowboy got popular. trying to retrace my steps, but bands started listening to Devourment, and next thing you knew, you had all these bands with this technicality, like Beneath the Massacre, but with ridiculously low vocals like Devourment. This bad boy came out, molesting the decapitated, and the 138 release, it brought devourment to the masses. And at the time, you know, Suffocation had just gotten back together and put out Trolls to Deny souls to deny, but when we first heard the original mix, we thought it was kind of like a joke with the production, because we were so used, <laughs> we were so used, we were so used to, like, crispy, dialed production that when we heard the Suffocation album, it just sounded super muddy. And it was all because our brains, for the most part, had been not re-triggered, but had kind of, you know, had the idea subliminally implanted, I feel. Like, this is too literally suffocating. It's too raw it's it needs to be remixed or something and luckily the label put it out the way that the band wanted it and the rest is history suffocation started putting out and no offense but there has not been 
good suffocation album or recording since Despise the Sun. I'm sorry. I, I, I'm sorry. That's, that's how I feel about that. Like, that EP to me was the end of suffocation. Not counting Live in Quebec release. That's its own, again, Live in Quebec. Suffocation and Quebec went together like peanut butter and jelly. For some reason, the technicality, the brutality, the stage presence, and everything of suffocation played such a big part mixed with the Canadian, like, scene from Gore Guts up until, you know, not so vile and beyond. There was so much just crazy, obscure, technical shit coming out of Quebec. And it was just a weird, weird time, like I said, for death metal in general. Because, you know, the only way some of these legacy acts would sell tickets was you have smaller bands like Beneath the Massacre alongside legitimately like six other bands playing these shows just to make sure that DSI got paid at the end of the night. Because otherwise there was no draw. Like I'm I hate to sound negative, but I'm not making this stuff up. I mean, if you were there, you know. It was dead. And, you know, I came from an area where certain people would legitimately, you know, be like, hey, like, again, like I said, like, oh, like, I don't, why are you wearing that shit? You, you, you still like that band? And you're, you're still, like, you know, in your early 20s, and you take it kind of personally. It's like, oh, yeah, fucking A. But, like, I remember, you know, I wouldn't say I completely, you know, brushed it aside. I had my, and they weren't even guilty pleasures. Like, there were certain, like I, like I said, I enjoy Beneath the Massacre because it's so over the top like i could never work with that band at all like it's just so just like i said when it comes to music theory and all that craziness that comes with like progressive and technical music i have no fucking clue i can't read music like you know just let me do my vocals the way i want to do them and it's all great but during this time period, you really needed to know your shit. You needed to be on point. You, it was it was just a weird time. But there was a lot of bands that you know, like for example, Origin. The first time I saw them live, it gave me a migraine based on how triggered the drums were. Like, the drums just sounded like this typewriter. But it was so loud on the mix that, like, it legit hurt my, like, head. And I had to go outside and watch the show. Like, listen, like, legitimately, I had to walk outside and listen to the show from outside. Because the mix was so bad. This happened a couple of times technical death metal bands. But it happened three. Count that. Uno, dos, trace times with mayhem. Mayhem? Oh my goodness. I can't stand their drum sound live. It's terrible. And the venues they play in Philly just made, do not do mayhem any favors. 
and it is brought, it's just so overly triggered it just it hurts your head because it just sounds like just like but like really loud and it's like ah come on like just play organically i love organic blasting i just think it sounds so good when somebody just organically bomb blasts, they're like, yo, check this out. It's like, you know? Hell yeah, I love that stuff. But when it came down to it, like, I always hate when people say, like, oh, that was my guilty pleasure. What's a guilty pleasure? Like, well, you shouldn't be embarrassed to listen to something that you like. Oh, I know. I think I remember what tour you're talking about. But uh, I, I saw them on, like, a Watain run with with Revenge one time. Uh, I saw them at the Decibel Fest one time. I saw them again with Watain. And another time also. But then I saw Attila do vocals with Sun twice. One other time I saw Sun with Malefic from Zapser on vocals during the Black One tour, which was awesome. Like, I'm not even going to lie. That was one of the best shows I've ever been to. And you might say, well, Sun's boring. Well, that's like, you know, your opinion, man. But it was great until they started winging wine bottles at the crowd because you can't see in front of you and i saw them on the grim robe demos with fucking thou they had thou open for them or it might have been eagle twin and the one tour one of them thou opened for them one was eagle twin and another time was just joe preston which was it was so loud it was awesome but the loudest band I've ever seen, besides Ohm, was Boris doing a sound check. It was me, the guys from Torch. I forget the girl's name from Hal. She used to be in Hal and do like merch for some bands and stuff. I think her name, Andrea Black, I think her name was. I forget, but we all watched Boris sound check. Like, it was the first night of tour. Oh, dude, it was beyond heavy. They had their son with them from Japan. And, you know the like, the headsets they give the people at the airport that work like on the planes and shit? Like, the big, like, ear protectors? Because you know how loud jets are and shit. The little kid had those ear, uh, like those headphones on to cancel out how loud Boris was. They had a gong set up. Holy crap. It, like, legit. I've never heard anything so loud in my entire life. It was just absolutely insane. And I still, to this day, have never heard such a loud band. Bong Ripper is up there, though. Like, they were pretty loud. But, yeah, that sound check was just unreal. And seeing Earth also was very good. But they just played a, a little... It was kind of chill. They played a lot of, like, the Teeth and the Lion's Skull and shit, whatever. Like, they played more of the country stuff. Nothing off like Earth 2 or anything gnarly like that. But there was a time period though where I really did get super burned out on death metal. But modern death metal. And I just, you know, went down this route very heavily. So I was listening to a lot more like grief um I hate God dystopia kind of your usual like suspects 
excuse me, like buzz oven, acid bath. But then I found like a sonder, and like from a sonder, I started getting back in the black metal through like weakling and wolves in the throne room. Talk shit, but when that 2005 demo came out, I was like, whoa, like, what is this? Like, this sounds like Emperor, but it's from America? Like, what? And up until Two Hunters, I was very into Wolves in the Throne Room, and then I kind of fell off until they put out that ambient record, which I absolutely loved. Uh, Celeste. Celestite, I think. It's all... It's, it's pretty much Wolves in the Throne Room getting their Tangerine Dream on. But, uh... Yeah, I just, you know, started getting more into regular just grind from the past. Like, started listening to more Repulsion. And I couldn't get enough Repulsion in my life. But also... You know, the first two Napalm Death records, I, like, couldn't get them off my fucking cassette deck. Macabre, Sinister Slaughter. And, like, the rest of my friends are, like, telling me, hey, you gotta check out, uh, you know, blah, blah, blah. And blarga, blah. And I was, I'm just like, nah, like, I'm good. But then, you know, I eventually would, like, check it out, and it would just be some mediocre death metal band that I just didn't care about. But then came this kind of resurgence of nasty, filthy death metal. And at the same time, this resurgence of like printed flyers promo tapes and all the shit that I was a little bit too young to be a part of growing up started happening again and I fell off due to that crap around 2011 to 2014 and then that was it I was done with that bullshit but I was still going to shows like in between but it wasn't until 2015 seeing Topos Nomos that legitimately changed my life because it was everything I had been wanting from death metal that I never had. And we had tried with my old band, but like I said, people would just stare at us like, why, like, why did you do a cut and paste flyer? And I'd be like, like, I still have some of my cut and paste flyers hanging up. And I, it's because, you know, that's how I always wanted to present, you know, my band and stuff. But trust me, like back in like 2004, 2005, uh, yeah, we'll get somebody, you know, can, can you ask your, your girlfriend to do it? Like, I know she's good with Photoshop and it's like, yo, like I spent five hours making this like but you know uh just and then next thing you know you got this trendy looking flyer and it just looks like garbage and i used to just hate that sh that stuff like it, it legit like it bothered me but then times like i said they go in a circle and bands like beneath the massacre and stuff started kind of disappearing a little bit to the background. You had record labels like Willow Tip, who still put out good stuff, and unique 
Leader Records, for example, also, who were still, you know, putting out brutal death metal, but it was also mostly brutal technical death metal. So it was still not really what I was looking for, but as soon as I heard Tapos Nomos, Pissgrave, Horrendous, Spectral Voice, Blood Incantation actually really started it. Because I remember hearing rumblings of this uh, Astral Spells tape. And when I first heard it, I was just like, yo, what the fuck? Like, and there's all, like, I have all these, like, here, real quick. Like, there's an old interdimensional extinction. Like flyer. I have a bunch of that stuff in here. They're just all over the place. But I just always thought it was very interesting how life will always work its way full circle. Like I'm sure there was a point in King Diamond's career where he might have thought, you know what? Like this is all over. But then in the nineties, like Again, two of my favorite King Diamond, uh, two of my favorite Merciful Fate records came out well after Merciful Fate's successful days. And what I mean by that is the obvious, like, Melissa, don't break the oath, etc. And then King Diamond's solo career. To me, again, really picked back up in 2004. Well, 2003 with the Puppet Master, or that might have been early 2004. And same thing goes for so much music. 2004 was another time period, and it's a time period we will go over in a different video. Because you had bands like the Dillinger Escape Plan blowing up. You had bands like Mastodon getting ready to sign a label deal with Warner Brothers. You know, these guys came from working construction sites. And then, a year later, they're walking down the carpet at the Grammys. Like, good for them. For real. Every, anybody that hates on Mastodon. First off, they're some of the nicest people in extreme music. Brent is kind of... I don't know if he quit drinking or not, but he was the only one that ever was kind of a savage when I was around, at least. But, like, Troy, super fucking nice guy. I, I really don't want to pull it down, but... I have, you know, my Leviathan signed and framed poster. They gave me a set of symbols to give to my ex-girlfriend on her birthday. Backstage of a Slayer show. Like, I've had some good times with Master guys, like, hanging out. And, you know, I'm proud of them. Like, I haven't seen them live, though, since 2005, probably. So... You know, I don't really know what they sound... I'm sure they sound great. I mean, they're professional musicians now, and they deserve it. And it's honestly a shame, like, what happened with, like, Baroness. They put out the record of their careers, and then that bus accident happened. Like, shit like that is such, like, such a bummer. And then... Again, if you want to talk about weirdness, around 2011 came the resurgence of heavy metal mixed with black metal. And what I mean by that is you had bands like Tribulation and In Solitude, like taking like parts, equal parts Bajas. Merciful Fate and, like, Blue Oyster Cult. Mashing them all together with a bit of, like, Merciful Fate evil. And, 
the outcome was these really, really awesome records. Like, Tribulation just started as a straight-up Swedish death metal band. If you listen to the horror. From there, Formulas of Death is like a straight-up Watain worship record. But then, like, Children of the Night starts getting a little bit more, you know, like, weird on, like, a post-punk type level. Like, there was, like, Bajas parts. And Down Below, also, I have Down Below because I like it so much. But In Solitude, to me, like, the self-titled especially, was great. But Sister was, like, just a landmark record. I need to get a copy of it. But that was another time, you know, you had the all-female, the Oath. The Oath was one of the best doomy heavy metal bands I had heard in a very long time. The one is now in Lucifer, but I don't know what the other girl plays in now, but it used to be like a duo. And I think they just had hired members playing the other stuff, but also like the Devil's Blood, who played more like a cult based rock and roll but still had like heavy metal and some black metal aspects but it was mostly you know occult driven heavy metal and it was cool but it just lasted for this little blink of time from 20 from 2009 I'd say to 20 when In Solitude broke up. When In Solitude broke up, like, The Oath broke up, and a bunch of these other bands broke up, and the only one that was left standing was Ghost. Out of that original batch of, like, new heavy metal type bands, the last band standing was Ghost. And you can thank Fenris from Dark Throne for that. Because he was the one that originally posted the demo on his blog. From there, Lee Doran at Rise Above Records, at Tom Death, X Cathedral, signed Ghost off the demo. Puts out their first record on Rise Above. If you didn't know, Rise Above Records label is Metal Blade. The rest is history. Like, it worked that easy. I mean, I wouldn't say it's that easy, but it worked out like that. For, I mean, the gimmick was perfect. Like, as lame as it sounds, sorry Slipknot, you did not you were not the new Kiss. Not only is your music terrible, but I just don't get it at all. Like, somebody sent me a new corn song. Holy crap. That was one of the worst things I have ever heard in my life. And I will never get that time back. See, people hate Ghost. But the thing about Ghost is, like, do you like Blue Oyster Cult? Because if you listen to the first Ghost record, it's actually really, really good. And, again, I don't care. It's a good record. I really like the first Ghost album. Everything else? Meow. But that demo and the debut full length are fire. And I will stand by that because they are. It sounds like Merciful Fate playing Blue Oyster Cult. What's there not to like about that? To me, again, for somebody like me, that was something that, you know, I had always wanted to hear. Like when I hear a band like Soft Kiss, I get kind of excited because it's like, wow, this is, you know, like 
shit that I really wish I could play, but I can't. I'm not that type of person. I'm not talented like that. Like, one of my favorite, like, modern acts right here. Dick Brooks. Like, trust me, this is so out there compared to, like, most of what I own. Because it's total death rock. Death rock, I fucking love that stuff when it is done correctly. A band like Beast Milk, for example, I wish I could play them without getting copyright. But Beast Milk is a perfect example. Who also changed their name? I, I forget what Beast Milk's called now. But like Climax, this is one of those records that was kind of recapturing Death Rock with these outside elements and just creating something very special that stands out and just was different for the time. And that's what happened in the mid 2000s with death metal. People were just looking for the next big thing. And the next big thing happened to be for a little bit Canadian technical death metal. And it just so happened that Scumlord Distribution put out like I said, when I was a bit younger, this was one of those albums that I listened to a lot of. And I did listen to the EP a lot more, but like... Mechanics of Dysfunction was just one of those over-the-top Canadian death metal records I really, really liked. And I just wanted to kind of share this weird time in death metal history with you. Where I'm sure there's going to be people calling this deathcore in the comments and whatnot. Well, the thing with Gate Creeper is, to me, they're a stepping stone band. Like, some of their tunes are pretty cool. Like, here's the thing about Gate Creeper. I like them in small doses. And what I mean by small doses... I like them on an EP, a split, just a full length is too much. And that mini LP they put out last year, I'm sorry, but that was so boring. Like that doom, the doom side of it. And I love, like f fucking, I mean, couple you guys and girls know how much I love like Funeral Doom. I mean, come on, I could listen to, like, Evoking all day and not get bored. I got bored in, in, in that new Gate Creeper song, like, four minutes into it. I was like, all right, like, come on, where's this, where's the sick part? Like, I was just waiting. I just couldn't get into it. But that's what, you know, bands like Atromantis are for, you know? If you're really looking for some, like, Fucking There's plenty of bands out there. But that's just Gate Creeper saying, hey, we're not just a stadium death metal band. We do this too. And they did. But now, yeah, it is what it is, you know? Because they know they will never, and I hate to say this, but they will never have the same amount of respect that a band like Morbid Angel has. It's just the way it is. Like, 20 years from now, do you really think people are going to be buying Gate Creeper records? I mean, they might, but they also just might not. But then there's stuff that you kind of know, it's like, you know, this is timeless. Like, this stands out. And that's one of the many reasons why Blood Incantation is one of my favorite bands on the planet. Because I know, like, 30 years from now, this is going to be like having a first press of 
death leprosy or something, you know? Trust me. You'll see. Because there's plenty of releases where I thought nothing of it. I was like, eh. Like, you know, whatever. I'm, I, I, don't, I don't need that. And then, like, I look at it now and it's going for, like, $700. And it's just like... Damn it! Like, I had that in my hands! Or I used to own it. Like, Niles Annihilation of the Wicked. I had that on red vinyl. And, like... I, I, I needed the money and I sold it. And, yeah, I felt like an idiot afterwards. <laughs> Same with Pig Destroyer Terrifier. I had a white one. Mastodon Leviathan Blue. First presses. But, you know, that's life. And... You know, you live, you learn. But when it comes to Canadian tech scene, I'm sure it's still kicking. Like, I'm, I mean, again, I was so surprised that Scumlord decided to put this out. Like, legitimately. And hails to Caligari for, you know, picking up copies. Because... Yeah, I just was blown away. Like, I saw it, and I was like, whoa. A Beneath the Massacre table. Like, that is, like, that's interesting. And, yeah. I just was very, like, just stoked. Because I wanted to have this conversation. But it can go on for hours. And I don't... I don't want it to go on for hours. Just because this isn't my equipment right now. I'm borrowing some equipment. But pretty much there was this time period where, you know, if you were to come out with, like, Black Curse, Endless Wound, nobody would care. You might get some, like, like Black Metal Maniacs to care. Because there was a black metal scene during this time period. And trust me, there was plenty of bands that were poser bands. Like, that included, like, Wolves in the Throne Room and stuff. Like, they were considered, you know, but, like, hippie black metal. Like, all that Cascadian stuff got, like, thrown under this, like, oh, that's, like, you know, that's weak. Like, you gotta, you gotta listen to this. But... I'm guilty of, like, going to the old Relapse retail store and finding that Staff Picks chart. And thank you to Ryan Haley's girl, Jess Watson. Yo, without Jess, I probably wouldn't be making these videos. I'd be making some sort of videos, but I don't know. If I would, you know, find, have found out about bands like Tangerine Dream, like, more obscure shit when I was a little bit younger that I, I wouldn't have listened to otherwise, especially black metal-wise, because I was introduced to the not-so-happy world of one-man basement black metal. And this was before Leviathan became a merch machine. There was a time where there was actually no official Leviathan merchandise. It was actually it didn't exist. If you got a if you got a Leviathan t shirt, it was a bootleg. But somehow Relapse and the retail store they used to have, they had copies of this stuff. And, like, this was way before Nocmistium, like, screwed up big time. Like, Instinct Decay had just came out, and Instinct Decay really changed American black metal. And if you don't believe me, hey, dude, that's one of the highest selling U.S. black metal records ever. And that's kind of crazy when you think about it. I was going to get the Zatzer, because 
when they did the Twilight self-titled after Scott, a.k.a. Malefic from Zatzer, worked with Sun and did the tour with Sun, he actually had merchandise on this tour. So that Zatzer shirt you see me wear sometimes, I got that at the Sun show. And that was the first time I had ever seen Zatzer merchandise also. And it was just the logo. The sleeve, I'm pretty sure it said Southern Lord. I could be wrong though, but I'm pretty sure there's a Southern Lord tag. And the back just has a picture of Scott like with his head down. I wear it all the time. I'll, I'll wear it in a couple other videos. But yeah, like, I heard Leviathan first. And Krieg also. I, I, I had known about Krieg because Knock Mystium. Like, I knew who Imperial was and whatnot. Like, I knew who Neil was. But when they also kind of went and did some, like, you know, death rock elements mixed with black metal, it worked. But James is one of those, I mean, uh, Neil's one of those guys, you know, he's really, really a good songwriter, but... He just feels like you know, inadequate. I feel so. I, yeah, I feel the same way. That used to be my main like back patch on my vest. Like I had the Creed Black House. Like that was my back patch because I loved it so much. And I really feel like Creed is one of the most slept-on U.S. black metal bands because. Neil just doesn't really, like, he thinks it's, like, not very good. Like, when I saw him, and this is the last time I think they played, it was 2017 at Decibels Metal and Beer Fest. And I regret not buying any merch from Creed. I'd already, well, here, here's what I bought. I could just, it's right in front of me. And trust me, it's worth it. It was worth it. I listen to it all the fucking time. But this is what I bought instead. <laughs> Titan Blood 7 Chalices. I had to. But at the same time, I kind of was kicking myself in the ass. I was like, fuck. I'm probably never gonna like, find this stuff again. Because he had a bunch of stuff on tape. Uh, all his like, new stuff. Like, uh, Blue Miasma... Oh, uh, the, the Black House, the um, Isolationist, like, everything, it was, he just had everything, and I was like, oh, man, like, I just spent my last, like, 22, man, like, I don't have, I think I had, like, five bucks, and I, I, I was, I needed something to eat more than I needed a tape, but, like, it was just, it, it's definitely a weird I don't want to say a weird band, but it all comes down to, you know, I, I really think if somebody was to reissue the Krieg stuff, like, legit, and gave it the love it deserved, it would absolutely blow up the black metal scene right now. I feel like the American black metal scene is doing very well right now, and it could only do a little bit better by acknowledging a little bit more of the past that we kind of look over sometimes. And that's the way I feel about, like, Beneath the Master. Because if I wasn't to have gone over this today, I'm sure some of you might have never heard this band before and had never known that there was a time period where that stuff reigned supreme. That was well, you know, more popular than, like, if you went to, a, like, a store and there was a Neurosis t-shirt, like an original Times of Grace tour on one side, and then, like, a Necrophagist 
Tour t-shirt on the right, they're going to buy the Necrophages t-shirt. That was just how it was back then. And, you know, it's all good. Luckily, camo shirts are kind of a thing of the past. I mean, sometimes you'll see some death metal bands where three three of the five members are definitely wearing camo cargo pants, which is kind of fun. I don't know. I always just thought that was a silly outfit, unless you're in, like, blasphemy or something. But I'm guilty of it also. It was just part of the times. Like, yes, I also used to wear a bullet belt. I'm proud of that bullet belt. I wish I knew where it was, honestly, because I, I would wear it. But when it comes to the massacre and the mechanics of dysfunction, hails to Scumble Distribution for putting this, you know, piece of death metal history out on cassette. I just think it's awesome. It's interesting, and it really takes you back to a time where things were very, very different. Like, if you were to tell people that in 2021, some record label was going to reissue Niles' demo on cassette, you would be like, <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> That will never happen. Well, hate to break it to you, past me. It happened. And yes, I know, Relapse did that, uh, you know, compilation of all the shit from the past. I'm talking about the demo actually being on cassette. That's sick. But my battery's about to die. Thanks for hanging out. And... Definitely check out the EP, but check this out also. Mechanics of Dysfunction by Beneath the Massacre. And thanks for watching. Fucking roll. Hails.